So here we're going to look at Pauling's rule number two, and this is related to this idea of the electrostatic valence principle or electrostatic valence bond strength. Now before we introduce that, uh, we're going to review just briefly the idea of coordination number. So there's another video where we talk about how the coordination number is related to radius ratios, and you can refer to uh, that other video on Pauling's rule number one. Uh, the way it relates here is that the coordination number tells us about the number of bonds that a given cation will form with anions. So let's say we have a cation of silicon and that silicon atom is bonded to let's say four oxygen atoms then we would say that the coordination number for silicon is four. Let's go ahead and erase the chalkboard and look at the implications for that. So uh, for silicon in fourfold coordination, uh, let's say we have the mineral quartz, so it's bonded uh, to two oxygens per formula unit, uh, then that silicon atom with a four plus charge is gonna be dividing that four plus charge amongst four separate bonds. So this is where we get the electrostatic valence bond strength, or we'll abbreviate that EVBS. So four plus divided by four gives us one, a positive one charge that silica in fourfold coordination can donate to each of the oxygen bonds. So again, let's consider silicon, and let's say it is bonded to four oxygens. So one, two, three and four, then each of those bonds will be, will have a plus one charge based on this idea of electrostatic valence bond strength. Now, to give a counterexample, let's take a look at uh, silicon in six-fold coordination. So we would still have a four plus charge but now that four plus charge is being distributed between six bonds. So if silicon is in six fold coordination, there's only a plus two thirds charge that can be devoted to each bond. So with silicon bonded to, let's say six oxygens, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, so here are six oxygens here. Uh, each of those bonds is only going to have a magnitude of plus two-thirds. So two-thirds there, two-thirds there, and so on for all of these bonds. That bond here will be weaker than this case here where we have a one plus bond, uh, excuse me, a one plus charge being donated to each bond with oxygen for the four plus case. So that's where the electrostatic bond strength comes in. The bond strength is directly proportional to this value here that we get by taking the charge and dividing it by the coordination number. So now let's take a closer look at the second rule as it is normally stated. Uh, and for the second rule, we're going to take silicon uh, in, um, in this case of quartz, and we're going to first have to determine this value n, the coordination number. So with the second rule, it's usually stated with respect to what kind of charges are reaching the anion. So Let's take a look at how we might figure out the coordination number n for oxygen. We don't necessarily need to rely on radius ratios. If we know that silicon is in fourfold coordination, since we only have one anion on the side, we can write a very simple equation where we take the coordination number four and then multiply it by the number of atoms that uh, pertain to that coordination number. There's just one silicon atom, and so we would take four and multiply it by one. And then on the anion side of this, we would have the coordination number n, which we want to find out, and multiply it by the number of atoms too. So this is four, four times one is four, and that is equal to two n, and so n is equal to two. So we can erase this fellow here and say that oxygen is gonna be in two-fold coordination. So for the case of quartz where silicon is in four-fold coordination and we have a formula of SiO2, if that silicon is bonded to four oxygens, then those four oxygens 
must in turn be only bonded to two silicon atoms. So what does that mean for the amount of charge that's being donated to each silicon atom? Let's uh, rewrite the formula here. We've got SiO2. Oxygen is in twofold coordination, as we've just determined, and silicon in fourfold coordination. So for our oxygen atom, let's draw this oxygen atom here, and it has two bonds emanating from it. One over here, connected to a silicon atom, and another over here, connected to another silicon atom. As we determined earlier, for silicon in fourfold coordination, it'll, its electrostatic valence bond strength is a plus one. So that silicon atom here only has a one plus charge that it can donate to that oxygen atom over here. And likewise, this silicon atom here has a one plus charge that it will donate. But the good news for oxygen is this. Take a look at this balance. Oxygen has a two minus charge and the total positive charge that's reaching oxygen is also plus two. So we've got a plus two charge emanating from the, very, the two silicon bonds that are reaching oxygen, and that matches or cancels the two minus charge on oxygen itself. So that means in Pauling's rules that we would say that this is the most stable arrangement. The case where silicon is in fourfold and oxygen is in twofold and where these bonds match the, the charge uh, on the anion, that is the most stable case. That's the essence of Pauling's second rule. And so what we've discovered here is that quartz is stable. Okay, no surprise. But if you had a different kind of compound where you weren't sure of the atomic arrangements, uh, then you can use radius ratios to uh, guess at some coordination numbers for the cation, and then you could play the similar kind of mathematical game to determine possible coordination numbers for the anion, and then see if the charges match up in that structure. If they did not, then the structure would not be stable. But if they come close to being able to match, I, I think in Pauling's original um, textbook, he showed that uh, plus or minus one-sixth of a charge is considered a pretty good match and within the air, at least at that time, uh, then you have something that is relatively stable and so would represent a possible structure.